Hi, I'm Sejal Vyas. I'm a scientific editor at Cell Reports. I'm at the Cold Spring Harbor Labs uh, meeting on brains and behavior, order and disorder in the nervous system. I'm here with Mehmet Yannick uh, from ETH Zurich. Um, and uh, yeah, how, are you, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for the interview. Yeah. Um, so we'll get, you know, started with, so you, you actually kicked off this meeting with your talk um, and you talked about neuronal circuit imaging to identify therapeutic drug combinations you know, to correct altered brain activity patterns and, and neurological disorders. So before we get into you know, the results and the key findings, what kind of led you to this approach and what was you know, the in initial inspiration for this type of research? Mm -hmm. My background is in engineering and computer science and physics. And one of the things that uh, always uh, surprised me is how we treat the brain. Brain is probably the most complicated uh, machine we know in the universe, and uh, it is more complicated than for all of the supercomputers we have. Yet, uh, when there is uh, a brain disorder, we basically perfuse the whole brain with uh, chemicals, expecting that uh, we will be able to fix uh, neurological disorders and brain disorders. And uh, uh, what my uh, inclination was that, uh, at least in simple animal models, we should be able to look into these circuits at a you know, very high resolution, at a single cell resolution, and see whether uh, we can try to fix them just like we fix uh, you know, man-made artificial circuits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so were, were there any you know, major technical hurdles you had to you know, overcome to get this? Because it was a very high throughput zebra fish, mm -hmm. you know, light sheet imaging platform you're using with mm -hmm. implanted you know, electrodes. So. Mm -hmm. so we had uh, a couple of challenges that we had to overcome. One of them is we had to make the imaging technique mm -hmm. uh, very rapid. So mm -hmm. uh, we developed a technique where we can scan the brain in, in about 50 milliseconds mm -hmm. and capture activity from about 15,000 neurons in these uh, small animal models. And uh, the other challenge is uh, uh, we wanted to test a lot of different ideas, concepts, and chemicals as well. We had to make this thing whole thing automated by using mm -hmm. microfluidics and robotics where we can handle uh, these small animals in a very rapid manner. And these were some of the technical challenges. Mm -hmm. And then we had computational challenges, of course, you mm -hmm. know, how to analyze uh, the data, how to look at it from different perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of w when you presented in, in talking about that kind of computation al analysis side and optimizing the various things you, you looked at as far as how many regions of the brain you have to measure and how many neurons and, and you know, what resolution, is that all go into because of these are, my, I imagine, huge data sets, you know, mm -hmm. the, to kind of minimize, you know, to get to, you know, as far as how much you need to measure mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. able to handle that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. those are some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the most important things uh, about our study uh, that we learned is that uh, there is absolutely uh, value to be able to see the brains mm -hmm. at uh, neuronal resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, since uh, we were able to image these brains in very high resolution, at a single neural resolution, uh, we were back, back off and increased the granularity, so mm -hmm. reduce what we can get from the, you know, make the data more coarse. And we would see that our capability to basically correct uh, uh, dysfunction, disconnectivity in these brains rapidly declined mm -hmm. uh, as we made our uh, approximations, uh, measurements coarser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, so getting to some of you know the interesting findings. So, so you guys used a, a specific zebrafish mutant that had a sodium channel, uh, a mutant in a sodium channel that mm -hmm. has clinical implications for for epilepsy, um, and so you found a two drug polytherapy that you know kind of really seemed to correct these brain activity patterns. So, mm -hmm. based on you know what's known about these the, the this drug combinations, do you have can you speculate on you know? How, how exactly they're, they're functioning to, you know, alter, to kind of correct these patterns? Is it through neuronal or non-neuronal targets? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the things about uh, our study was uh, the approaches, the methods we used, mm -hmm. they were uh, relatively independent of the disease model that we studied, the disorder mm -hmm. model. SN1 it causes epilepsy and autism, as you mentioned. And we picked up this one because uh, as a model, this has been you know, uh, successfully used, uh, you know, in zebrafish, and there are many uh, preliminary data on this thing, both from our lab, also from other labs. And uh, so uh, your question about, you know, how we identified uh, these drug combinations, 
this is basically by looking at these activity patterns in the brain and how individual drugs perturb these activity patterns, uh, we can you know uh, find drugs that actually can perturb the brain in quite different ways and then combine them to make an overall correction to the brain activity pattern that can completely normalize mm -hmm. uh, uh, the dysfunction mm -hmm. in the brain. And uh, now it's not clear whether we can directly take these molecules and apply to higher organisms obviously mm -hmm. uh, because uh, these chemicals, uh, these combinations that we identified, they are engineered for this particular brain you know, mm -hmm. that we are sitting under question. Uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, to follow up on that a little bit, and, and you spoke about this again in the talk about the difficulties in, you know, tr translating this to, oh, you know, a higher order mammalian brain or also, um, you know, having mul more combinations than just two drugs, you know, the expanding drug combination. So kind of what do you, is that any um, area that you're looking to maybe pursue, a, you know, at a later point or if, mm -hmm. if you were to go there, kind of what approaches would you take? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> I can say that we have a couple of lessons that we learned, uh, you know, out of this study that we did on zebrafish, you know, mm -hmm. uh, while we are trying to correct these uh, network dysfunctions. And one of them is, as I mentioned, it is very valuable to be able to do single neuron resolution measurements. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to do this thing over the whole brain. We just need to do this thing over limited numbers of areas. And we also need a limited number of neurons. We don't need, you know, thousand neurons. We need mm -hmm. maybe a few hundred neurons per area to do these kind of uh, measurements. And that's one of the things that we are trying to push forward, basically, trying to develop technologies where we can make such measurements in mm -hmm. higher animal models, mm -hmm. rodents, and hopefully in primates one mm -hmm. day to be able to pick up such an information from the cortical surface. So those are some of the technologies that mm -hmm. I that mentioned in my talk that mm -hmm. uh, we are investing time right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and, and switching gears a little bit, you did cover on a few other topics in, in your talk. Mm -hmm. One of them was the focused ultrasound for, mm -hmm. for drug delivery. And, and so uh, you had mentioned that, you know, chronic focused ultrasound has damage to the, to the blood-brain barrier. And so this was kind of a, um, you're trying to take a different approach mm -hmm. as, at least to get the spatialized uh, mm -hmm. drug delivery. So can you talk a little bit about how, how your approach differs from other things mm -hmm. that have been doing, being mm -hmm. done in this area? So one of the important things is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we treat brain today, uh, we treat it like a whole piece of meat. You know, mm -hmm. we basically perfuse with the chemicals, just like we marinate mm -hmm. <laughs> meat. And I think uh, one of the, the, the issues that, fundamental issues that we would need to address in the future as we get into more intractable disorders, mm -hmm. for example, is to be able to target circuits uh, more in a specific, specially specific manner, you mm -hmm. know, in three dimensions. And for this purpose, uh, uh, we have been in the lab uh, developing focused ultrasound technologies. And this is something widely used, mm -hmm. uh, certain focused ultrasound technologies across several different labs in the mm -hmm. research domain. But we, what we particularly did is uh, we did uh, use high throughput approaches and mm -hmm. microfluidics to basically design these microparticles that are actually ultra sensitive to the ultrasound yet they are stable enough mm -hmm. and then we could then basically trigger these particles to release uh, their drug load mm -hmm. uh, under the ultrasound without mm -hmm. actually causing any kind of uh, brain damage mm -hmm. as, as we can detect you know mm -hmm. so and that opens up uh, immense possibilities because then we can treat uh, the brains in a chronic mm -hmm. manner mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly and that's what you would assume in a neurological disorder, unless you can completely, you know, cure the disorder, which is uh, not very likely in some cases. In many cases, I would say, uh, you need chronic treatment, and this kind of a technology opens up such a possibility. Now, the second trick that we did is uh, when you treat, uh, when you use these micro particles, systemically inject them, and when you target individual brain areas. Uh, you are just uncaging molecules in the local area that you are trying to treat. And we developed uh, an approach actually that allows us to concentrate these mm -hmm. microparticles by about, you know, uh, several thousands of times mm -hmm. beyond what you would find in the body in, in local brain areas. Uh, actually, I would say any brain area that mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you know, we can target with the mm -hmm. system such that we can basically significantly enhance uh, therapeutic uh, precision, mm -hmm. efficacy of delivery mm -hmm. over side effects that such drugs would cause mm -hmm. in the rest of the uh, circulatory system mm -hmm. and body. Yeah. 
And so, you know, that sounds like a pretty powerful, you know, drug delivery mechanism as far as, you know, for potential neurological disorders. Can that be more broadly applied to, you know, glioblastomas, other type, you know, just other diseases of the brain that aren't necessarily um, you know, neurological disorders? Certainly, I think uh, these technologies can be used for mm -hmm. those domains as well. And uh, particularly in neurology or in, in brain disorders, mm -hmm. th these technologies would be, I mean, the particular one that we worked on would be very uh, necessary, mm -hmm. I would say, because uh, unlike, uh, you know, maybe cancer and other uh, uh, diseases, uh, you know, you need to treat the brain, uh, you know, chronically, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you need to be able to do this thing. So, so what we spent our time making this technology minimally invasive and very highly efficacious is uh, going to be ultimately very powerful for neurological and brain disorders. Mm -hmm. For cancer, uh, uh, if you are, let's say, trying to locally ablate uh, a particular area or, or tumor mass, I think our uh, capability to concentrate drugs you know, by physical means in very local areas after systemic injection, that also would be, I think, something that could potentially be very uh, enabling for those mm -hmm. kind of treatments. Mm -hmm. And so, so you've talked a little bit about, you know, the type of technology you're trying to develop. Um, you know, what, what do you think is kind of just beyond reach that you'll be able to do in maybe, you know, another two, three years that, you know, after developing these tools? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, investing a lot of time right now mm -hmm. trying to develop uh, these uh, recording arrays that mm -hmm. will go above the cortical surface that have some unusual properties so we can extract the type of data that we were able to extract from zebrafish brains mm -hmm. and use these things uh, to treat the brains. And we have right now uh, uh, certain neurological disorder models in the lab, mass models, mm -hmm. And our goal in the next couple of years is basically to see whether uh, we can do these kind of network manipulations in rodent models and mm -hmm. then bring their normalize their brains uh, to an activity level uh, that you would expect in a wild type uh, mm -hmm. animal model. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so, you know, kind of also thinking more broadly about all the different types of, you know, this is a very broad, I'd say, neurobiology meeting with a lot of different approaches being taken. Do you see any, any way where these different approaches can inform on each other, where they can, can kind of converge to, to mm -hmm. you know, look at these types of um, problems from different, different ways? Mm -hmm. So this is a, a very large mm -hmm. meeting, obviously. Mm -hmm. We have uh, people from various different backgrounds. I see a couple of major themes mm -hmm. emerging in this meeting. One of them is uh, uh, the, the depth of understanding of individual uh, diseases mm -hmm. uh, has been increasing exponentially. I mean, right now people are talking about whether it is a genetic uh, mutation, whether addiction, mm -hmm. talking about you know specific uh, areas in the brain, specific synaptic dysfunction, specific mm -hmm. molecules. And uh, uh, this is highly exciting area. Uh, so this, this is the fundamental uh, progress being made. On the other hand, people are also very open-minded. Uh, mm -hmm. As you say, as you see in this meeting, there are many uh, ideas of translation, uh, translational research that goes beyond just giving drugs to individuals. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, technologies that people are talking about, uh, ranging from focus ultrasound to transcranial magnetic stimulation mm -hmm. to potentially optogenetics in higher species to basically, you know, uh, interrogate and also to, to basically manipulate brain circuits to, to mm -hmm. fix these disorders. And, uh, you know, uh, so if you talk about things like, uh, you know, putting uh, microarrays on cortical surface, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound uh, mm -hmm. extremely crazy mm -hmm. to the audience uh, currently. Um, and, you know, kind of taking a step back, maybe away from the brain, you know, if let's say tomorrow someone said you can no longer study anything, uh, you know, anything in the brain, you know, neurobiology, what, what, what would you, other areas of research that you would find interesting or maybe would want to dig into? Oh, that is a very interesting mm -hmm. <coughs> question. I think uh, uh, artificial intelligence would be mm -hmm. one area. and. There is a lot uh, that, uh, you know, commonality in things that we study in the brain, you know, mm -hmm. how it works and what the AI community is interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, I think, going to be some sort of uh, convergence on certain areas, in mm -hmm. certain areas in the near future. Mm -hmm. And there's already a lot of uh, 
uh, cross talk between these two areas. So mm -hmm. if I were to stop working on uh, 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 brain itself, I would mm -hmm. probably go into the AI field. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. Thanks. Thank you.